It's not down in there. Hey, it's not down in there. You gonna get it? Are you gonna get it? <laughs> what you got, Jess? Hello, guys. Nigel here again. Welcome back. Part six already, and this is now the final assembly of this uh, transfer box. And what I'm going to do is loads of editing. There's going to be loads of like on off on off on off. I'm just going to leave the camera running. And uh, what you're going to do is see basically how to put one of these together. If I've shown you now how I shim all the bearings up. I'm not saying you should do the same. That's my way of doing it. Um, and, and what we're going to do is see how it all goes together with all the proper sealant and all the bits and pieces and seals and nuts and bolts and God knows what thread lock and all sorts. So um, we'll follow the manual. I've got my um, Amazon Fire out here. The manual for assembling it is sort of all over the place. So it's kind of almost difficult to follow. So um, it's kind of doing a little sub, sub assemblies I think and then bringing it all together at the end. So the first thing you have to do, I've done this off camera because there's no way I was going to do it on camera. The front and the rear output housings, this is the rear here. You have to put them in the oven and heat them to 100 degrees centigrade um, to get them hot enough to push the bearings in. Get them to 100 degrees centigrade, get the bearing square, it drops in and the, the bearing that just sits there. And then what I did while it was still hot, I put the sir clip in to make sure it didn't dislodge. The front output housing, which is over there, that's the one with the diff bearing in it. Remember, I put that in with the shims. I took it out of the oven and then sat in the bottom of the oven was the, the bearing and the shims. So I came back to the garage, quickly put the circuit clip back, put the bearing in, put the circuit clip in, turned it over and I managed to just drop them in. And then once it all cooled and everything, it was pinched. And um, I just gave it a little press just to make sure and it's down. You can't move the shims. So that's how you know that bearing is down. As you can see, we've also got the seal in this end now. And I uh, made up a little tool. As you know, I do make little tools for everything. This is an old grinding wheel, actually, grinding wheel hub. And that basically just goes in there and that pushes that one in. And it will do the same on the um, on the front output housing as well. So i um, got new seals for that. So that seal's gone in. Um, again, didn't film that. You've seen me press millions of things. You don't need to watch the press pressing stuff in. It's not exactly exhilarating. So looking in the manual, the next thing we're going to do is fit the rear output shaft into the into this bearing and it's telling you to actually press it in rather than bang it in. So I'm going to go over on the press and press this in. We've got the um, we've got the gears. This is the gear here for the speedo drive. Obviously that's removable because you get different ratio speedo drives. You've got a, a chamfer and a grooved face on one side and on mine that was against the actually against the flange on the shaft. So why that's that way I don't know but um, Basically, you need to make sure you get it back the same way and also get it on square so it doesn't bind. Look at that. It's because the camera's on. If I turn the camera off now, that would fall on there on its own. I'll turn the camera off. Right, so that's that. That's that shaft in there now, just pressed in from behind. Um, you can press against the aluminium casing because, of course, you're pressing into the bearing, which is pressing into the circlet, which is pressing into the casing, so that's fine. Um, obviously, don't put too much pressure on it, you'll, you'll break the casing. But uh, that's in there, that's all lovely, it's spinning freely on its brand new bearing. So that's that. The next part of the manual tells you to fit the speedo drive in here, um, which is the most stupid idea I've ever heard of, because basically what you're going to do is snap it off. If you put that down, on the bench like that and then it rocks over it's going to snap it off because it's made of plastic so I really would suggest not doing that at this point I would leave that till the end or at least until it's bolted onto the transfer case so it's got some protection um, protection is what it's all about so the next thing it's telling us to do is go on and heat the front output housing and put the bearing in which I've already done and then press in the seal and you have to make sure the seal is just on contacting the circlip and then it's telling me to fit the front differential bearing track and selected circlip, which is already in there, so I'm not going to worry about that. And then we're going to push the shaft in. Right, so the seal's in now. Seal's in that housing there. You can see it in there. So now what we need to do is fit the output shaft to the rear housing. And this is the short one. We've got the drive dogs there for the, uh, for the diff. So um, that's all cleaned off with a bit of rag and cleaned off in there. And we've got to fit this spacer. I've got to make sure that the chamfer, you can see it's got a chamfer inside to it. That faces backwards according to the manual, faces the threaded end. So what we're going to do now, apparently you press this in and you drive it in with a mallet. Now, I'm not happy about doing that, I want to press it in. 
So I'll take it over to the press and I'll press it in and then I'll be back. Right, so the next thing we have to do now is put the, um, the diff lock and the hilo mechanism together. Now I haven't been able to replace this o-ring because I don't have one the same size but I have managed to do the the uh, the hilo one I did have one of those this one has gone a little bit square this one here is absolutely fine so what I've done is I've just clean these bores out put some oil in there just to lubricate it bit of oil on the shaft and then we're going to put it all together now we need to make sure that this goes together the right way so we've got our shaft going in from this end and we have it facing like that so it's got to go that way so we'll put the shaft in hope you can see what I'm doing put that lever in there push the shaft through like so until it goes right up flush on this face here so we're up flush and then if we move that lever forward we can see down in the bottom of there we've got a bore if I don't know if you can see in there if I turn that you can see down inside that bore here the hole lines up so you need to get the hole to line up and then we're going to put the thread the um, grub screw in but first of all I'm going to put some thread lock on it whoops this is the trouble these ball ended allen keys they don't hold things very well so put some thread lock on there You can't have too much, you do not want this falling out and going in your gearbox or in your transfer box, should I say. Oh. There we go, so we can screw that in and you'll feel it go into that ball socket. I've lost it. Obviously the shaft has moved. You see if the camera wasn't on that wouldn't have happened. You can see what happens as you turn it it kind of all aligns itself and then give it a good good tighten <coughs> so that it's not going to come out like so and there you go so that's that one done and it also goes on here about fitting a selector we haven't uh, a switch but we haven't got that so um yeah it's telling you to fit uh, put Hylum RPR32 onto the threads so then we've got this um this part here and this is the actual casing for the um don't need any more of that so we'll put that away that's actually Loctite 243 I'm using it's a thread lock and seal so we can um, put the put some oil on there make sure that o-ring's got plenty of oil on it and then push that into that bore like so there we go and make sure you give it a good old wiggle about Just going to put a little bit of oil in the top because even on, on mine this was you know it hasn't been wading or anything it was a little bit sort of sticky it wasn't seized up it was just a bit a little bit corroded a little bit sticky and there we go we just put that nut on there loosely and that will hold it together and now i need to find a new o-ring for there and then that'll be that assembly done Okay, so that's those bits done. Now, as I said, this manual darts around all over the place and the next thing it talks about doing is setting up the preload on the input shaft, which is the first thing I did. Now, I'm not going to put the input shaft in until I actually fit the transfer box to the gearbox because it makes it so much easier to get it on without having to try and line that 10 spline um, shaft up. So I think I'm going to do that after. As we know the preload's all okay and everything and I can do the bearings and all that. It'd be absolutely fine. So... What we need to do is um, move through the manual and it tells us to put this rear output housing onto the actual um, onto the actual transfer case but I want to fit this flange first because trying to hold the transfer case and do that nut up to 120 pounds feet is gonna, not going to be easy so I'd rather put it in some soft jaws in the vise on the shaft and hold it like that. So um, 
let's see how we get on with that. Right, so as some of you will know, my this transfer box used six or, or a locking compound, which was extremely strong on these splines. And it was, I think it was probably as a seal because there was no felt washer. You can see these are the flanges now, they're all um, cleaned up and painted and nice and everything. So um, basically I'm, I'm going to use 638, which is a very good locking compound because I didn't plan to take this apart again, but heat and presses will get it apart easily. Um, but in the actual real world, I would rather put it back together with a felt washer, but the thing is, what they've used is a very, very hard, very good retaining compound, and I don't know if it's because maybe there's a issue with the tolerance on the splines, or they change the tolerance for ease of assembly. So I'm just going to put it back together the same as they did. So what I'm going to do is put some, put some 638. Come on. I'm just going to put some 638 on the front of the splines. So that it forms a seal. Now, I'm probably putting a little bit too much on, but they absolutely had it slathered on here. It was everywhere. make sure it gets in every spline because this is not only a locking compound it's also a seal and it'll stop the oil coming up the the splines and leaking out if it does leak I can always put a uh, felt washer on but at least I know now I've got that, this on here so we'll place that over the splines like so I'm just going to work it up and down to make sure it's gone in there yeah. So that's gone down now, so I can put the washer in, put the nut in. As always, not prepared, I think it was 27. There we go, that's pulled down now. So now I can get my torque wrench and I've got this, this tool here that I've made just for locking them and you can basically put that over like so. I'll pull that and use the top wrench to pull against it. So um, I'll get that done and then I'll be back with something else. Okay then guys, this is actually 24 hours later now, so a couple of seconds for you, a day for me. So I've identified my bolts. If you remember, I did my little notebook and I wrote down all the lengths of the bolts we need. And for this rear housing, it's five M10s by 30 and one M10 by 45. Now obviously some of these holes are open and they all need thread lock and they, some of them need sealing. So we'll put thread lock on all of them. Um, and then we'll put some silicon around the housing. What I'll probably do is just put the silicon on first, then do the thread lock. Give that a good shake. This is the uh, Loctite 243. And then I'm going to put some silicon on here and drop this in. So I'm just going to check first of all if this shaft, that's okay, it's going to sit down. I just want to check it's going to sit down without that shaft hitting the, that's okay. So I've cleaned the faces off with brake cleaner, so they're all spotlessly clean and dry and grease free and I know there's nothing on them. Let's give them an extra little wipe over. Okay, and I'm going to put the silicon on here because if I put it on there I might miss these recessed areas. So I've never used this stuff before. It's white by the look of it. I would much rather be using something out of a caulking gun. Here we go, it's starting to come now. So we can put a bead of this around. Like so, turn that round. Like 
I'm watching paint dry any guys. And they're gonna come from there up around here. Make sure we get that sealed in and then I'm going to make a circle around each one of the bolts. Reason being I want the I want the silicon to help form a seal because as I say some of these threads are open so there's a direct channel to the outside or from the outside to the inside the oil can get out and I hate oil leaks with a passion. Remember guys, that's why I stripped my engine, because it had oil leaks. And I want to check the oil pump. Okay, so that's that all done. So we can put this down now, and then drop this on. Now it's going to be orientated in a certain way, so make sure it goes in the right way. You don't want to be twisting it around after you've uh, got it sat down. So it's going to go down like that. Then we need some thread lock on the bolts. I'm going to use a little bit more than you would normally use because it's also going to be acting as a sealant. And I know that when they built these, wherever they built them, they used a lot of thread lock. Better safe than sorry, I think, with oil leaks. So that one's going to go in there, like so. Now the longer one goes at the top. Here we go, and as usual, I'm not prepared, I don't have any sockets out or anything. So I want a 13mm, yes, and I want my torque wrench. These bolts have got to go down to 25 newton meters. So it's already set on that. Naughty boy, I left it set. So we'll just go around here. So we'll give a little tweak in the shoe rather than pull them down. Let the silicon float around and do its job. And the best thing to do with situations like this to save yourself dragging all around the bench is put it like that and then you can use the weight of it against the torque wrench. Best radio pattern I've ever seen, but hey ho. Okay, I'm just going to go around the mall, make sure I got the mall.
there we go. That's that done. You can see we've got a nice tidy bead of silicon there. I'm not going to touch it. I'll let it just uh, dry like that. Right, as if by magic, a beautiful Ashcroft ATB centre diff has appeared. Did I I've staked the nut just. So remember, I didn't do it before in case I got anything on there. So what we need to do now is fit the selector shaft and selector to the diff and then put it all in. But before I do that, I'm just going to add some oil. I'm going to put plenty of oil on this bearing. Let that run around. I'm going to put some oil in there. And I'm going to put some oil on these splines. Just to help it go in, I think. More than anything. And also, I don't know how long it's all going to be stood, so... You won't be going back in that chassis for a while, I know that. Because I've had to think about what I've got to do with this, and... I've got to come up with a sort of plan of action really for the sequence I'm going to do this in because it's no good having the chassis all painted and everything and having all the suspension axles and everything not ready it means the axle the chassis will be outside back in the conditions again not covered up so I need to get a plan of action so I think after this I'm going to start on the axles because once the axles are done then I can start on the chassis and I can, I'll have something to put the axles on, put the chassis on so I'm going to put some oil on there to help it go in Drop this onto there, and according to the manual, the manual says next you've got to put the uh, speedo drive in again. So I'm not going to do that because I, I I don't want to break it off. It's plastic, so I'm going to do that at the end. Um, so turn this shaft around, this diff around, should I say, and then this has got to slide onto that shaft. And at the same time, we've got to get the the selector to go in and align the splines. On the diff so once I feel the selector start to that's going in now I can turn the input shaft and get those splines aligned and there we go we're on so the selectors in it doesn't appear to be sliding there we go the selector was holding the diff out. So there we go, the diff is now sat on its bearings and the selector is in its bore. There's a neutral. Oh, that's high and low isn't it what we're talking about, it's not neutral. So that should be low, yep, and that should be high, yep, so that gives free to spin. There we go. So that's the diff in. Now I think the next thing to do is put this cover on. Now the manual goes on about setting up all your shims and everything now, but as you know we've already done that. So now we need to look at getting the rear cover on. Right, so um, here we go, we've got all the parts here. Now when you come to build the front output housing, they tell you to put this dog clutch on, or dog ring on, um, there. But the trouble is as soon as you turn it over and put it on the, on the gearbox, it's going to fall off. So I'm going to put that on there. Now it may, has to go with the chamfered side rearwards okay so that's going to go on there like that i'm also going to oil the bearing okay so make sure it's got plenty of oil on it and i think i'll drop some oil down in there as well just to just to give it some lubrication because as i say i don't know how long it's going to be stood for now i've cleaned all the faces off with brake cleaner i've got the bolts here it's 7 m8 by 25s and 1 m8 by 90. so let's do the same here again I'm going to put some oil on that spline as well, I think. Right, guys, um, this is something I'm inserting kind of halfway through the video, but this is actually near the end of the video for me. Um, but as you can see, all the parts are still separate. When you get to page 44 of the manual, it tells you um, once you've got the diff in and you've got the front output cover and everything on, um, <clears throat> it tells you to fit the selector the spring and the selector shaft into your housing and the manual tells you to uh, basically the shaft is going to go in here okay and it tells you to slide the shaft in from this end so you slide the shaft in into that hole which has got a plug in it which is absolutely wonderful so I tried to knock the plug out so that I didn't have to strip it all down, but I couldn't get it out. 
so I had to strip it all down. So I've just spent the best part of two hours cleaning off all the silicon I just put on, which as you know is a right chore because it's all still gungy and soft, much easier when it's gone off. And I've had to take all the thread lock out of all the threads and clean up all the bolts, make sure I don't get any big lumps of silicon or anything, blow it all out, you know, get a wire brush down through the bolt holes, all because of the bloody manual, again. Like, I, I don't know where Land Rover got their technical authors from, but their manuals are dire. The, the, the manual for the engine is just a waste of time. And the 07 onwards Puma manual, which is basically available free online, so you shouldn't really moan, I guess, but you know, it only covers left-hand drive vehicles. And it says that like, right-hand drive similar, and it's nothing like it. And then in the middle of it, it goes off from Range Rover parts and stuff. It's just an absolute bloody joke. But this manual, you know, I'm hoping that people that do a transfer box rebuild that, like me, are inexperienced with this transfer box. I'm not inexperienced in mechanics, but I'm inexperienced with this particular box. So if you follow the manual, you're going to get it wrong. So hopefully you guys are going to watch me. The other thing I wanted to say, uh, today is actually Sunday the 15th of March. I'm hoping to get this video finished and up today. Somebody sent me a message, like Simon, um, I'm assuming he's Australian or American because he's sent me some quotes he's had in money. And he's been quoted $2,300 by a garage to do this, to do this job, to fit this diff for him. Um, my message to you, Simon, is you may as well get in touch with Ashcrofts and buy another box because a reconditioned transfer box from Ashcrofts is 495 British pounds. Um, if you have the, the ATB centre diff, they reduce the price by £45 to £300 and they will fit that in for you at the same time. Now, it's probably an exchange price, so if you're abroad, maybe the cost of postage of sending your box back would be prohibitive. So even if there's a core charge of, say, £250, that means for a £1,000 British pounds, you're getting a complete transfer box built by Ashcroft with all new bearings and everything, um, and you've got your transfer box to sell on. So paying a garage $2,300 to do something that you know you can replace practically new for less money I wouldn't bother so um if I were you I'd get in touch with Ashcroft Simon and anybody else who's considering this as well I mean when I'm looking at this now what I've actually spent on bearings and bits and pieces for this I probably may as well have bought one from Ashcroft's built already so you know pays your money takes your choice guys anyway I've got I'm showing you how to get all this goes together now the right way and then after this I'm going to revert back to me fitting all this on as I recorded yesterday so you'll notice all this is going back on but without the selector and everything fitted so don't be confused that's the way I, I just can't be bothered to film it all again you know putting on the silicon putting on the thread lock putting the bolts in talking it all up so this is going to be a bit of video where I'm going to show you how to do this little bit here and then we'll jump ahead to what I did yesterday so going back in time if you like and you'll see me put it all together but without these bits in okay see you in a minute okay so let's start getting this together so we've got our um, selector fork here now I've got the the dog ring in here they call it a dog clutch in the manual get this out if I can um, if you may see me talk about it in the, uh, later in the video, I actually put this on the diff um, so it didn't fall out when we put this on, but obviously that doesn't count now. Uh, I'll try and edit it out if I remember. If I don't, then ignore it. Um, so this is going to go in here and you need to make sure it goes in with this flange facing out. So that's just going to go in there and sit on the, and sit on the, um, on the shaft like so. Next thing we need to do is take this spring, compress it and make it go into here, like so. Like that. And I'm just going to use the shaft to make sure the spring is aligned. So that when I come to put the shaft in, it won't be a problem. So that's going to go like that. Now the fork is going to drop. I've already oiled everything up. The fork is going to drop into the dog ring like that. And now this shaft is going to go in, it doesn't show you in the manual, make sure it goes this way around. So you've got these two detent rings here, they're going to go where the detent ball and spring goes here. And then you've got your selector going to go in there 
and then the spring this is the part where you slide your spring together so again I've oiled everything up already I'll just put some oil on the shaft just to help it along and that's just going to slide in there the twisting motion I think I'll put some oil on there And that's just going to slide in there all the way like so okay now rotation doesn't matter at the moment I can clean the oil off my hands rotation doesn't matter at the moment because we're going to turn it afterwards what we need to do at the moment is get these these spring locks in and they slide over these two flats here so what I'm going to do is get a little tool like so okay and then I can take one washer and these are special little cup washers that hold the spring can you see that they hold the spring in but they slot down over the two flats so I'm going to grab the spring and pull it back and then slot that one on there that's that one in and then grab the spring well the same spring the other end Pull it back and then slot this one it's working again the shaft is moving it's not supposed to do that it's because the camera's on so we'll push the shaft forward we pull the spring back and just slot that over the two flats why is it being such a pain come on there we go, that we're now going over those two flats, like so, and there we go, and as we can see there, if you can see that, there we go, the spring is in those two little cup washers. So now, the, um, the dog clutch is basically now able to engage. it's dropped down that's why basically the dog clutch has gone off center so I need to pull that back into the shift fork turn it and then it goes in there we go so that is basically that spring is what gives you the the movement so that when you engage for some reason it's not playing ball basically that gives you the movement so that when you when you engage it allows you to sort of slip it in rather than bang it in you know so that's sometimes why when you disconnect your um, diff lock the light always doesn't go out straight away it's because you've disconnected it and then bang it'll disconnect afterwards so there we go so that's that done now well, let's move along okay so something I've noticed now which is gonna be a little handy tip for you guys when you move this around the dog ring falls off the the actual um, shaft and then won't go back on so my suggestion is to now fit the detent with the diff lock engaged with the shaft back and that way it'll stop it falling out so what I'm going to do is just put a drop of oil down in there like so and then we'll drop the ball remember when we stripped it down we wrote diff lock on the bag and you got a high low and a, and a diff lock and then I'm going to put the spring and the ball in there now in the manual it's telling you to fit the the screw and then wind it back two turns well what they've done they've changed the design and now you've got a a sort of um, allen bolt going in there rather than a, a grub screw so you just do it up so it's down um, they've obviously done all this for ease of assembly but I'm going to put some thread lock and seal on here just to make sure it all seals in put plenty on there don't want oil leaks and then we'll just put that down in there hopefully you're on camera are you just off so let's bring this back I've got the wrong Allen key I'm just 
just going to undo that a couple of turns, do it up, just make sure that thread lock gets around there. Okay, and there's no torque given in the manual for this, so obviously because the manual is referring to an earlier version. I remember when I took these out, they were bloody tight, probably because of the thread lock, but uh, just do it like that. Leave that to dry out like that, and that thread lock you can see is all oozed out around there. So it's going to be a, a good seal. And now it's locked in place, it won't keep falling out. So that's going to really help with assembly. So that's that done. Go. So, and I've got it temporarily stood on the front output flange. So what I'm going to do, once again, same as before, go around here. That's a lump in that, so I'm going to get a piece of paper towel. Let's be careful of that. This is the trouble with these little tubes. Drying the nozzle, so don't need lumps in it. So start again. There we go. closer with that one and again we want to do the same job we want to make sure that we get around all the bolt holes what I'll do is I'll form a bridge there Okay, so now let's go round the bolt holes, like so. Not quite sure I need to go around that one, but uh, in fact I need to make sure I've got a bead around the outside here. And that one is actually sticking out. Is that a bolt hole? Just in case. We can always wipe it off afterwards. There we go. Now I want to make sure I've got that area there, so I'm going to put some in there just to make sure. So we can drop this down now. Yep, we can drop this down onto our onto our transfer box, and that. Spline shaft is going to go down in there. We've got the dowel hole there, that's it. And it needs to drop down over that selector shaft. And then it's got to jump down onto its spigot diameter. For some reason, it doesn't want to go down. Right, that's all torqued down now. And um, I haven't permanently fitted this front output flange yet, I'll do that in a minute. But um, this just shows you the benefit of the torque bias in diff. Now if you remember, with the standard diff in there, it's all kind of clunk, 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 clunk. And even with the diff lock or, or diff lock in, it was still you know, clunk, clunk, clunk. So this is with the diff lock. Um, this is with it in. Okay. So as you can see, I can't turn 
these either way. Okay, I can only turn them and, and that drives that one. So if I take the diff lock out, if I can make it slide out, I can't get it to slide back. There go, that's with it out and it's still, I cannot turn it. So that's the beauty of this, it sort of locks up the drive shafts, but if I lock one and do the other, I can actually turn, and I'll show you in a minute when I do the, um, when I do the flange nut. Okay, so you go, for those that haven't seen this before, there's the tool, you just make up with a couple of bits of steel, and then you put your socket on the nut, like so, like so, and then we can just wind the nylon nut on, got the torque wrench set to 120 pounds feet. It's got some pulling in to do yet on that flange. I've got the six, oops, it's come off again. I've got the 638 on there, the same as it was from the factory. So we're putting it all back together as it was. much easier to do this when it's vertical but of course it's becoming a bit unwieldy now and hard to handle and there we go so I can just make sure that the tool is right up against the flange and then I can just pull these together like that and there we go now what I'm going to show you is this diff, the way it works. So I'll turn it around, let's cover up my 638. Turn it around so you can see what's going on. Now the, what I need to do here is lock, I'm going to lock this side up on the bench like that. Now what I can do is turn, turn this one until I can slide but the diff lock is still engaged oh, okay so here we can see unfortunately this torque wrench only goes down to 60 pounds feet so I can't measure the torque but it should be somewhere around 45 pounds feet I think um, that's just from memory I can't remember but basically the diff is unlocked um, you can't see it but you can hear I've got it unlocked, so there it is back, and you can see that if I hold hold this this end here, I could do this, and it's stiff to turn. Okay, and it's it's actually that's what it's going to be doing in the Land Rover. It's going to be driving four wheels all, all the time rather than just having, you know. So if the if the if the front axle has no grip, it will still get some drive, um, and it will give drive to the back end as well. So um, yeah, well worth having, uh, worth every penny, just to get rid of all that clunk clunk, if you ask me. At this point, you realise this manual is a complete and utter load of bollocks, because it's now telling me to fit this selector shaft, and there's a plug in there, and I don't really want to be driving that plug out. And it doesn't tell you to drive that plug out anywhere in the manual, so really what I should have done is assembled all this with the selector fork, the spring and the caps, before I actually took it apart. So yeah. Thanks for that. Little tip guys, particularly for you guys that are fitting the Ashcroft torque bias in diff. Um, because it's a torque bias in diff, it's not like the the standard differential where you get all this, um, you know, you can just turn everything all independently and slide everything in together nicely. It's kind of very, very stiff and I cover that a little bit later in the video. Um, so what you need to do, when you put all this together, you actually need the dog ring to align with the diff when it's in locked because obviously you've got it held up now what you could do is offer this down and then try and turn everything and get the the dog ring to fall down onto the diff but that won't be too easy and i would suggest doing this vertically like i've got it here so what i've actually done to put this together and i haven't filmed it because it's so bloody awkward to film but i've got a bar and i've put a bar through the bolts on the 
rear output shaft so that and I've wedged it up against the wall so it can't turn and then what I've done is taken a socket on the top there and if you can see that on there I've taken a socket on the top like so and then turned this independent of the other end and what you do is select diff not locked like that so in here you've got the detent spring which is holding that down and you can see the spring here is compressed and then as you turn it with the friction against holding the bottom one and not letting the top one and so the top the bottom the, the rear output shaft is solid and the top one turns and all of a sudden it'll spring in and then it will go down but until you do that you won't get this housing to go down so it's really sort of you know unless you can get it in the unlocked position to start with and manage to get it together like that I don't know but um that's basically what I've done so that's something I thought about and did and I had to be pretty quick because obviously the silicone was going to go off but basically that's what I've done is is put it in like this so it's held so the spring here has got tension on there trying to put it into diff unlocked and then when you turn it independently I mean I don't know if it's going to do it but I haven't got the other end locked but I don't know if it's no it's not going to go look but um I don't even know if I can get in there and hold that one. Can I? Right, I've got it set down on the bench now on its side so that I can show you exactly what I'm talking about because this may get some people confused. Um, imagine you're dropping this on there now. It won't go all the way down. You've got a gap here between the, the two casings. What you do is you select diff unlock and you can see the spring is compressed but the actual selector fork is still in lock. So now I've got this end clamped down solid and if I turn this end what will happen there you go you see all you're doing is aligning those those teeth which are on this on this shaft and on the end of the diff so you're allowing it to go into diff unlocked and that will allow you to spread the, to, to put the casing on then right following along with care with the manual um we've now got to put the diff lock selector in now because this is a puma i've taken the lever off and left it attached to the mechanism other variants will vary um, i've also noticed in the manual they're saying the the actual detent ball and spring for the diff lock is here whereas on the on this one it's here so not quite sure what age the manual is referring to the other thing they tell you to do is put the diff lock switch in now they have a lock nut but with the actual with the diff lock switch that you get with the um with the puma there is no adjustment it just literally screws in um and i'm not sure which is which i'll have to check my manual now my my, my wiring but um we've got one for the diff lock and one for the um high low so um basically i need to make sure that i get the right one because as you can see they are different they look very similar but they actually are different. So I can refer to my photographs I took before I stripped it down, which is always a good idea, take photographs of everything, and then I can see which is which. So I'm not gonna put those on yet anyway for fear of them getting knocked and broken off. So um, what we've gotta do is fit this. Now we've got an O-ring on here, so we don't need to use any sealant. What I am gonna do is put a drop of oil on the O-ring, just a small drop, just to get it. To help it go in and I'm also going to put a small drop of oil in this bore just to assist it with sliding in. Now we need to fit this in here and make sure that we get the drop of oil on there, make sure that we get the um, the slot lined up. So I'm just going to drop this in here Like so now I'm not sure again I need to check my references I need to make sure I get this in the right orientation I'm assuming that's it because it won't go in any other way so I'm going to turn this shaft in its slot make sure it's lined up now you can't see down in here but basically that has got to go into that slot in the shaft. Now, if I put it this way round like that, the shaft is actually sticking too far through by the look of it. So let me go and check my references and make sure that I'm getting it the right way round. Okay, so this is what I mean about taking photos. You can see here, I've got this photograph on my other phone and we can see now 
we look here we can see that that actual is going in with the you can see it's got the bolt hole closest so it's going to be going in that way round so that the the actual pin is, is the actual pivot is closest to here okay so that's going to go in with the pivot here not over here not over here it's going to be there and also if we look in this photograph we can see the difference in the two switches you can see one has a longer hex than the other where's these switches here they are see them gone one has a longer hex than the other as you can see there okay so we can see the one with the longer hex is actually the diff lock and the other one is the high low okay so we can put this down over here and we can put this in with the pin facing to the side like so and we get the holes lined up drop a thread lock on the holes on the thread sorry not on the holes and these are three m8 by 25 bolts there we go so i just check we're on 25 newton meters yep and we can just torque those down and then with a 10 millimeter open-ended spanner you can just check the operation and that's cool because everything's lined up it's shifting beautifully so happy with that right the next part now is to say to fit this uh, this switch but I don't want to do that um, they're also talking now about putting the cover on here so let's look at what we need for that okay so we're gonna fit this cover now uh, we need to make sure that when this goes in it lines up with the um, with the slot in the selector shaft I'm just gonna put a drop of oil on here okay and on here there are no there's, there's no um, open holes they're all blind so we don't need to worry about um, having thread sealer or lock on there so I'm just going to go around here I'm going to go around like this I must say this nozzle is bloody awful put some around each bolt hole just to be sure the reason we do that is because we don't want oil coming up around the bolt and then leaking out underneath the bolt head although this area here doesn't really see much oil as far as I can tell Okay, so there we go there's a bit of a dry lump there that was what was causing me the problem this stuff does dry in the nozzle very quickly and there we go so now we can just slide this on and make sure that the lever lines up with that slot and it has so we can go in like that get the bolts and it's six M8 at 55 volts. Two in there. get the socket off and make it easier to get them in I 
and then on here we've got this metal bracket which I've painted so it's looking all lovely and we'll just put this in like so and this is for your wiring harness to go on to for the two switches these are wasted bolts so make sure you uh, don't tighten one up without having the other one snuggled down so we'll do this in a diagonal pattern we'll just nip them down first And we'll tighten the middle ones first. It's that one. It's that one. That one. And there we go. So there's our high low selector lever and don't forget your, with the puma you've got this little rubber thing here and that stops it all rattling around this is just a push on clip if you remember i'm going to fit the um the diff lock switch uh don't forget the aluminium ceiling washer and i've also just put a drop of thread lock and seal on there just in case because my thing for oil leaks and i'm just going to put this in and like tighten it down as i say there's no there's no adjustment, there's no, um, what is that, 19 mil, isn't it? 18? No, it's 19. So, I've got a 19 mil spanner here somewhere, I know I have to. So we just nip that one down, and that one's in there now. And then this one doesn't actually clip on there yet until the other connector goes on. And then we're going to fit this one in here. This one will give it a clean up. Just so it's nice and uh, pretty for its new life. New lease of life, should I say. So again, we'll get the aluminium washer, give that a clean up. It's got some sealant of some sort on it I seem to these just give them a quick wipe over the wire brush and I'm kind of breaking away from the manual now because the manual has just turned into a joke it's, um, it's on about setting switches up with meters and stuff like that which we're not going to be doing so I don't want that one do I just going to put a drop of thread lock on here as I say not really as a thread lock as a sealant here we go just give that one a nip down there we are job done and then this can clip on like so and that can stay there so that's those two on. Okay, so now it's time to fit this um, this side cover onto the diff lock. And as you can see on here, because the older models had gaskets, you've got this raised ridge. So I'm going to put the silicon on there to make sure that I get the silicon on either side of that ridge. Right, there we are. I've got a bead of silicon all around there now, as you can see. And I've made sure I've got it over the ridges. In fact, I'm going to put a little bit more down in this corner because it's a little thin. It'll all lose out anyway, but um, I just want to make sure we get enough in there because we have to remember that um, bridge is going to sort of form its own gap with this being on the side of the transfer box. I don't want leaks. I can just go down on there. Like so, and then we've got seven M8 by 25 mil bolts. Again, no thread lock required. Because they're um, they're all blind holes. So it's a funny actually. When you look at the design of this transfer box. It seems that all the holes on the bottom 
are open <laughs> and the holes on the top are blind. It seems sort of the wrong way round, really. I'll just get my socket to help me spin them in. The, um, there was like a thread lock on them. In fact, saying that, I really should put some thread lock on them, shouldn't I? Because they used it. So I'm going to go stop and put thread lock on them, then I'll talk them up and I'll be back. Right, here we are now. Major time. I'm going to fit the intermediate gears. Now, to enable these gears to spin freely, which will make it easier to put that in, I fitted the detent ball and spring for the high-low so I could now lock it in neutral. Okay, so it just sits in the middle there. Now, I've got my new shaft, new, new rubber o-ring on there, which comes with the kit you get from Ashcroft's. A new rubber o-ring actually in the casing, oil on there, oil in there, make sure it all gets lubricated so that it all slides together nicely. Now there's a chamfer on here which is nice and clean, I've made sure that's nice and clean and not going to damage the, the o-ring as I push it in. In fact what I will do, no I won't, I'll tell you why in a minute. I was going to put some oil on there but I won't. So what I'm going to do now is just take this wire off of here. Now in the manual they tell you to hang the gear in there and then play with the shafts well i've had a better idea i think this is a far better idea is to do it on its side just take the assembly apart slide it in there get it lined up and drop the shaft down through and then you haven't got all the fuss about trying to line everything up so you know with it all trying to fall away from you all the time and this gear is bloody heavy so i've got the wire on there to keep the bearings in their correct location i.e front and back with the front and back races if you remember when i did did the assembly of this so we'll get this off of here and then we got the bearings out okay so get some oil on this bearing work that in okay so that one's our top one as we're looking at it now so we'll get the wire out of the way so that one's our top one as we're looking at it now, okay? That was just something there to keep the bearings in line. And then put some oil on this one. Work that in. I'm also going to put some on the races here. Okay, so that's our bottom bearing as we look at it. So what I can do now is come along with this gear, with the spacer in there. I can hold it like that. This is the first time I've done this, so I hope it works. <laughs> Pop that in there like that, and then slide this in. Now hopefully I'll be able to slide this along. There we go. Just slide it in there until it lines up. That easy. It saves all the messing around with the wires and everything. I'm trying to support it. And then what I can do is put some oil on this shaft like so and then drop it down in okay so it lines up with the sleeve that's gone in like that now it came out with all those bolts in so I'm assuming it should be back in with all those bolts in I just want to make sure I'm getting it lined up on that bearing. Yeah, I'm on the bottom bearing now. There we go, now it's coming through the housing. And we just got to push it beyond those O rings. Right. So, something I've seen people do here is put a drop of silicon around here. The other thing I want to try and do is make sure I get that flat in the right orientation although I can I can't remember which way it goes now the flat is opposite the staking and this is going to go on that way I want the staking slot facing me which it is so it's about right so we can push that down in 
working against these O-rings, it's not easy. I think what I might do is give this a little gentle tap, very gently. There we go. So that's gone in now. And that's, that's it. And I think that is probably much easier than wrestling with it and trying to support it and everything. So what I'm doing now is just pop it out a little bit and I'm going to put a ring of silicon around here before it goes in its final little bit. And it just prevents any oil leak should that O-ring decide to give up. Okay, so here we go. I'll just get the camera. Get on there. You can just see now the silicon in around there. So what I did was just put some around there, pushed it down in and then wiped it off neatly. And it's left a, a nice ring of silica around there just in case that o-ring decides to weep because that is a common place for oil leaks apparently um, especially if you start to get a bit of play in the uh, in the shaft as it were so there we go that's that one in now i've got to turn the gearbox or the transfer box over on its side get the dummy on or the dumbbell should i say this is what i call it and then um we'll get that all torqued up and fitted okay i brought you in a bit closer now um for those of you that don't know about this this goes on and if you saw before they messed up mine so I filed off that lump that was on there. Basically what you can do is put this on and engage on that flat and then you can turn the shaft until you're sort of in between. Okay and then we can just get a M8 by 25mm bolt and I think that, that is actually a through hole isn't it? Let's just check. I think it's a through hole. Yes, it is. So um, we'll put some thread lock on there. So we'll get our thread lock. Put some thread lock on here. Again, for sealing as much as it is for locking. That's why I put so much on, because I want to make sure I don't get any oil leaks. Right, so that's going to go on there like that, and then that bolt can go in there, and that has got to be torqued down to 25 newton meters, just like every other bolt in this thing. There you go, that's down. I think we'll have to put a piece of wood under there, just a bit rocking about. There we go. Now. I want to make sure that I don't do the same as the original person that built this did and have the shaft just ripping up against the the um, the back of the washer there. So what I'm going to do is actually give this a nip um, with a socket, 30 mil socket. Just make sure I'm not just pulling that shaft up against that. Because what I can do, you see, is the the shaft, as you notice, the the dumbbell thing rocks side to side. And I've got this um, staking slot here directly opposite, so it's in the centre. So I can make sure that when I tighten this one up, that the shaft doesn't turn. Now that other one I had, the other shaft, if you remember, the thread was really tight. So as you tighten the nut, it was just turning the shaft, and that was why they pulled the um, that is why they pulled it into the back of the dumbbell thing rather than rather than actually talking it at all so what they've done is had no preload on the bearings so that I'm happy with that so apparently now because this one's got a spacer rather than a crush sleeve what you do here is tighten this bolt to 65 newton, uh, 65 pounds feet so I'm just gonna give it a little bit more there we go so that is pulled down and I can see that slot is still dead central, it's pulling a line between those so I know that shaft hasn't turned. So now I know that I've got the right amount of preload on those bearings and I can feel it's just, it's just got some drag there. So I'm happy with that. I'm just going to check that's tight. Yep. So I'm happy with that, that's lovely. Now I think this will be a lot better than it was before because if you remember I had bearing spinning issues. So there we go, that needs to be staked. 
So I should grab my really neat little blunt chisel. These are great, these old blunt chisels. Don't throw them away, really, or even sharpen them because they're great for staking stuff. Which my mother here it is. The bench is getting a bit crowded now. I need to have a clear up. I'm just going to stake this nut. Like so. I need a bigger hammer. I don't think that's going to go anywhere. There we go. That's in there for life. My life anyway, I hope. If I got all this right, it should never have to come apart again. So there we go. So what we can do now is fit the the sump. We've got the drain plug and the filler plug to go in. The speedo drive to go in. And then we're done. So let's get this sump on. Right, the sump is now fitted. Um, didn't film it because I put the radio on and Leonard Skinner came on free bird and I wasn't going to turn that off for anyone. So, um, yeah, basically put the silicon on the sump. I've used thread lock on the bolts because some of the bolts are through holes. Um, I fitted the drain plug. It says in the manual to tighten it to 30 newton meters, but they're showing a bolt type. This is actually a tapered bung. So I've just done it so it's sort of in there and it's got plenty of thread lock on it to seal it. Um, the filler plug I'll just put in lightly because that obviously isn't going to be going anywhere. Um, when you do the sump, I would suggest, because mine was slightly bowed, I would suggest, it says to tighten the diagonal sequence, I've gone 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, like on our head. Um, basically just to make sure you're pulling the centre down first and you're not tightening the outside down and then you're, you're trying to compress the... If it's like this, you're trying to compress it as you tighten it so you won't get the full torque on the bolts. So I'll just go around and check those again. 25 Newton metres. So just give them a check. One, sorry, coming off. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten. There we go. So that's that's that pulled down. So hopefully that will have sealed, and I will get no oil leaks. And we can see we've got a nice bead of silicon oozing out all the way around. If you see any blank areas where there's no silicon, worth checking again. Maybe take it off, clean it up, and do it again because you, it, it's easier to do it now than when it's under the vehicle and covered in oil. So um, yeah, best to do it now. Also, when you turn the gearbox over, I meant to say, I keep saying gearbox, I mean transfer box. When I put those wires on, be careful you don't break them. I should have not fitted those switches yet. So it's time to put the Speedo gear in. Now, the, we've got the actual Speedo drive here, which is all quite rusty, so I need to clean it up. And we've got an O-ring on there, so I'll have to oil that and everything. So I'm going to put that in. And then we've got this piece that goes on the top, this plastic part, and that's driven off that square and this is the bit that I didn't want to actually break so I'm going to give this a clean up now I might even put it in the lathe and give it a clean up and um, and then get that in I've got the bolt in there already and we're pretty much done right so to finish up now um, I've put the speedo in the speedo drive didn't bother showing you that because it's basically just a, a little m5 bolt I cleaned up that rusty bit covered it in the oil to stop it rusting again and then put the speedo drive in um, reconnected these wire clips at the top the banjo bolt, I hope you can see that. They've got a banjo bolt up here. I've put some new copper washers on there. Left the old ones on just to space it out so I don't get any debris going in there. So now we're going to put this cover on just to keep everything clear. I've put the um, filler plug in loosely. Um, so basically, as I mentioned before, I'm not putting the intermediate shaft in at the moment. I'm leaving that out because I want to I'll fit it when I actually fit it onto the gearbox because it'll be much easier to do. So I'm just going to put all this on dry. If you remember when we took this apart, we made some pot marks. There's two pot marks there, and I know there's two pot marks here. So that's going to go on like that. Now, with this one, it's obvious because you've got this hole to line up here. Okay, so it's obvious which way it goes. But it won't actually fit the wrong way because the holes aren't equispaced. And for some reason, it's become tight and it doesn't want to go in. It sounds like it's just started pouring down the outside again. So here's your normal weather report. Okay, so that's that on there, and then we've got this cover here, and again, this is also pot marked because of the sort of odd bolt pattern. We've got the two pot marks there. Okay, so then these bolts will go in and hold this rear cover on, 
Now obviously we would use sealant on the covers to, um, to clamp it down and I will be tempted on the, the one with this one that's, that's going on to the casing. Well, this cover here will have the normal white silicon. I think I'll be using something else on that one um, because it's pulling down as we're bearing face. Now here we've got a stud bolt. I think it's for the wiring loom. That one goes in there. So it's in the actual lower bolt hole that one goes like that. I'll just, again, I'll show you my photographs I took. So you can see on here, I've got it there so you can see that stub bolt is actually in the bottom there. Okay, so it's, as I say, it's invaluable taking photographs. So when um, we put those bolts in there, if I was doing this properly now, they would be tightened down to 25 Newton meters. But I'm not going to be tightening down because it's pointless. I just want to put this on as a cover too so I don't lose the bolts, I don't lose anything and it will stop any debris getting in there. So there we go. And then just to finish off, there is a bolt over here, in case you, you've got an odd bolt in your box. There we go, here's a bolt here. This is your earth strap. So this is, um, it's there, I'll show you where it is. It's on the side where the uh, input and output, the, um, sorry, the front and rear output shafts go. So there we go. There you go guys, that's it, finished. And the transfer box is built. Hope you enjoyed that. Sorry about all the sort of bittiness of the video, but as you know, the manual let me down big time, as I said to you during the middle of the video. I'm not sure how long it's been. I know this is my third day of filming. Um, and, and yeah, it's probably an hour and a half, two hours long or something stupid. So I hope you don't get bored, but what I wanted to do, what I've set out to do, is make a video on how to, how I've put this back together and showing you how I've made it work and then the, the, the one or two tiny little things that are different with the um, torque biasing diff over the standard diff. If you are building this transfer box with all standard parts, you can follow me exactly. If you follow the manual, you'll come and stop like I did, so be a little bit careful about that. I um, want to thank Ashcroft for putting this together, making this diff. It's absolutely amazing. I can tell straight away, like I showed you earlier, the fact that it's all locked up is amazing. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, got rid of all that stupid daft, you know, clunk, clunk, clunk and everything, which is really good. Um, the shim kits they provide make bearing setting a complete joy, as I showed you, as I showed you in previous videos. And I really like the sealant they supply. This white um, Hilo seals looks like really good stuff. As I say, I had to take the gearbox apart only at about an hour after putting it together, or less than that, and it really did not want to come apart, and it took me hours to clean up, probably two hours. So yeah, good stuff. Um, basically, that's, that's it, really. I mean, the this this nut here, you know, 65 pounds feet, according to somebody who um, posted for me on the Defender2.net on the forums, 65 pounds feet for that nut if you've got the spacer rather than the crush sleeve, so happy with that. Um, make sure you replace your copper washers on your on your breather tube or that may, may leak. Don't lose that rubber washer that's on there. You can't quite see it there. Here, that rubber washer, don't lose that because um, that'll make your, um, your, your, your uh, shaft your right uh, stick, gear stick, that's what I was trying to do, the stick will rattle. So um, yeah, you want to be, uh, make sure that, that is, um, that's still on there. Take care with your speedo drive, that is really flimsy guys. You can see how soft and flexible it all is all moving about. Uh, my flanges, if you want to know, um, I primed them with Carlos S primer, I sandblasted them first. I primed them with, then I put them in the oven to get all that horrible stuff off. Uh, um, thread or bearing fit, wherever they fitted them with, which I've, you know, I'm running them down and I've done exactly the same, but only because they did. There may be more than just sealing in it. Maybe they've, you know, knowing modern car manufacturers, they'll do anything to save a penny. And um, I know I've worked for them. And uh, yeah, they may have slackened up the tolerances and then used the bearing fit to take up the slop, which makes assembly quicker because they don't have to press them on rather than just slide them on. I don't know. You can't trust them these days. Some of the crap they produce is unbelievable. Um, so yeah, Coral SS primer, two coats of that, very thinly applied on this face, and then I masked this face off 
obviously because you don't want paint on this where the prop shaft goes and then painted everything else with the gloss black that's why you got that lovely gloss black finish on there unfortunately fit the circlips on it scratched up slightly on both of them but hey you know i could always touch it up um, and this one's going to be inside the brake drum anyway um, these bolts here that i haven't showed you fitting they're, they're just put in loosely um, they hold the the handbrake back plate in um, so um, it's actually a transmission brake, isn't it? It's not a handbrake. So basically, they are fifty-two pounds feet. They're torqued up to when you put the um, when you put the the brake back plate on. I would suggest putting some thread lock on them as well, just in case. Um, so there we go. That is it all together. I hope you followed me all the way from part one, all the way up to now, which is the end of part six, because I've tried to video as much as I can of it all coming apart, the issues I found. Hopefully, I'm just the unlucky one, and, and you guys don't find the same issues. This one here was the biggest bugger. This one cost me the most money. Um, and the fact they had so much peeled on those bearings, I don't know. In hindsight, um, having spent this much money on this box, I don't know if I would have actually just bought another box from, from Ashcrofts. But also saying that I know this box has only done 16,000 miles. I know it hasn't got any chipped teeth. I know there's no wear on any splines or anything to speak of. So, you know, at least I got peace of mind that I've built it. I know all the bearing settings are correct. I know everything's good. And I know that all the gears, you know, were made together. They've all bedded in together. You know, if you do get a reconditioned transfer box, you may not get the same gear set. You know, if they've if they've had a gear set come in that's damaged, nothing wrong with it because what they do, I don't know if you've seen the videos, but Ashcrofts actually have a jig and every transfer box they build goes on the jig and they run it up to like 4,000 RPM or something just to make sure it makes no noise. So that's the sort of care they're putting into their um, finished products and making sure that everybody's happy. So that's really good. Um, but as I say, if you've, if you've got a transfer box that's done 150,000 miles and you're thinking about fitting one of these centre diffs, you know, the centre diff is £345, I think it is. And then you got like £55 for the fitting kit. So there's 400 plus your VAT plus your delivery. Then if you're going to get the bearings, that's another 70 So that's 470 Well, an exchange gearbox is 495 plus your 300 for your diff. You know, have a think about it before you go giving garages money. Failing that, bring it to me and I'll do it. <laughs> um, for $2,300, as somebody was quoted. Yeah, right. So uh, there we go. That's it. Hope you've enjoyed it. Um, just going to give myself a bit of a disclaimer now. Everything I've done here is the way I do it. All the products I've used are the products I like to use. Every cleaning process, everything I've done is the way I like to do it. And if you do it differently, that's fine. Um, if you decide to do it like I do it and it goes wrong for you, then I'm sorry, but you know, you're, you're doing something wrong. So um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'll see you all soon. I've got over here, I'll just turn the camera around so you can see. There we've got an axle to start on because I've been thinking with this build, I need to be considering what I'm actually doing because it's no good having the engine gearbox transfer box all built up and ready to go in the chassis before the chassis is painted. And it's no good having the chassis painted if I haven't got any suspension to put it on. So I'm going to get these axles done first. I'm not going to do video of stripping the axles down. There's millions of those. Go and look at uh, LRTV or Trader Fitter's Toolbox. Have a look on there. He's shown you. There's lots of videos showing you that. And his, his stuff is really, really good. Um, Chris is his name. Um, so have a, have a look on there. But also, um, I'm going to be, for a little special treat, I'm going to be fitting Gwyn Lewis uh, pumpkin or diff guards to mine. And I may even trust the front axle as well just because I can. <laughs> um, so yeah, that'll be a special treat and I'll be doing a full how-to on that, showing you how to, you know, not strip the axle down, but how to work with a stripped axle. Apparently you don't need to strip the axle down, but I really would suggest it. If you're gonna be in there, you know, grinding and stuff, you really want everything out of the way, you want everything dry, and then you can make sure you get all the, the grinding media out. Plus one of my uh, seals is leaking, I've got, the grease from the CV joints leaking into the uh, act, the diff oil and vice versa. So I need to sort that out. And because of that, I think it's because it's got thinner oil. One of my swivel housings is weeping as well. So I'm going to strip the axle completely down to all its bare bones, rebuild the diff, um, probably with a locker and put a, a diff cover on there and everything from Gwyn Lewis. So uh, 
I'll see you for that. I don't know how long that's going to be, but it won't be very long because the weather is starting to get better and I can work out here all day long every day. So I'll see you all soon, guys. Thanks for watching this. Hope you've enjoyed it and uh, I've waffled on long enough now. Bye for now.